Welcome to the March, the second program of March for our 32nd year. I, I know there's a couple here. How many World War II aviator-related veterans are in the audience? Stand up, please. Stand up, please. I, 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 I know there's another one. There's another one. Where's Ray Peterson? Ray Peterson. Okay, now you keep sta standing, sir. Keep standing. Now, our other World War II veterans standing. I know that there's a CB back there. Stand up, please, Mr. Johnson. Yes, sir. And then, uh, thank you very much. Sir, what, what, what was your service in the... Where's Ray, where's Jim Rasmussen tonight? Do you know Jim? Do you know Jim Rasmussen? Yeah. Hey, I got to get his contact. No, I don't think Jim came tonight. I, I had lunch with him uh, uh, yesterday, though. Yeah, he's doing great. Thank you for coming. I'm going to turn this over to um, to Sarah. Sarah Rickman came from Colorado Springs. Uh, uh, the The thing we're going to do, Sarah is going to uh, present her presentation, and then we have a uh, a current Air Force lady pilot, Major Michelle Morse, and she's going to talk about how her what motivated her to get into the uh, into the uh, Air Force to be a pilot and some of her highlights. And then uh, last year at the air show, uh, we encountered this lovely young lady, uh, Danielle Hemmingson, do I see that right? Who is a reenactor and will talk about uh, why she chose to be a reenactor of, uh, of the WASP. Sarah? Tell us about the wasp. No, I was not a wasp. I was in kindergarten when they were formed in 1942. So you probably can figure out how old I am, which not as old as, as the wasp. The youngest living wasp is 94. There are only 38 left of 1102. That was the sum total. That number comes from 28 original WAFs, Women's Auxiliary Ferrying Squadron, and 1,074 women who trained in Texas, first in Houston and then in Avenger Field in Sweetwater. That's what most of you know about, and most of them trained there. They, and I lost what I was going to tell you, which was just a marvelous thing. Uh, it will come back. It will come back. It's hell to get old. Uh, Don forgot a couple of things. And I tell you, I've, been, I've been running with, with, with men and women the last couple of days who are just like me. We all forget things periodically. <laughs> but at least we understand each other. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, th the 1,074 who trained uh, in Houston and then uh, Sweetwater uh, were first called the Women's Flying Training Detachment. Woofted. <laughs> Aren't you glad they changed the name to WASP? Okay. Nancy Love formed the, the WAFs, the Women's Auxiliary Ferrying Squadron, starting in sept well, through the summer of 1942, and she recruited between September and December 1942, the 28 women who flew for her, the first American women to fly as a group for, for, the, for the military. We had some who had already gone to England. That's another story. But the WAFs were the first women who flew as civilians for the U.S. military starting in 1942. She did recruit 28 between, between then and December. 
In the meantime, Jackie Cochran started the uh, flight training school with Hap Arnold's, okay, he was with her. Uh, she started that in November. The first class reported no November 16th, 1942, graduated in April of 43, and all of them went straight to the WAFs to join them in ferrying trainer aircraft. Uh, now, they weren't, they weren't like the little cubs and all stuff, you know, 65 horsepower. These were 175 horsepower PT-19s, and somebody stop me if I'm wrong, 250, I believe, or maybe 400 horsepower uh, PT-19s. Uh, tr uh, tri uh, twin, twin, uh, ah, yeah, two, two wings, by wing, thank you, by wing. Anyway, uh, that was their first assignment, was to sign uh, ferry primary trainers from the factories to the, the training fields in Texas. Nearly all of the, of the Army, uh, Army Air Force's training fields were in Texas. And that's where they took them. Okay, how did they get the name WASP? Jackie Cochran exercised her, uh, her pull with General Arnold, and in uh, summer of 1943, she, she said, I think that there, you should have a woman as the head of this whole organization to ride herd on these young girls, and Hap brought into it. So he named Jackie Cochran uh, the uh, director of women pilots. That was in July. 43, she promptly changed the name instead of WAFs and Woofted. And by then, some of the Woofted were flying as WAFs. Again, Women's Auxiliary Ferrying Squadron because they were ferrying. And she came up with a name that, honestly, when you think about it, it's good. Women's Auxiliary, <laughs> Women's Air Force, Women's Air Force, Air Force is one word service pilots. And I will tell you one thing that, can I tell you nicely, one thing that WASP is W-A-S-P, not, there's no S on the end. And the reason is, that's already plural. And I learned this after I started writing because most of the early stuff has the S on the end. And I learned it and since I'm writing about them, I damn well better have it right. So I, I write it correctly, and half of the others do, and there's some who still spell it the other way. But I just want to tell you, WASP will do it, right? Marie's, Marie's husband back there, uh, she was class 44-1. Yeah, that's what I thought. Same as, as Liz Drophus. Okay. While, while I'm there, how many of you here know Liz, who Liz Strophus was, is? Okay, okay. For those who don't, uh, Class 44, one, redhead, uh, a spitfire, if there ever was one. Uh, I knew her, did not interview her, uh, but I knew her. And the story I, I, I would love to tell, I was not there, but every, at Sun and Fun, which is held in April in Florida, uh, the the 99s always have a luncheon for the WASP who are attending. And several years ago, was I, as I wasn't there, but I, I read this and then dutifully reported on it, uh, they had a tornado. Now, the WASP luncheon was held in a tent, large tent, down at Sun and Fun. And all the WASP friends and, and, and uh, followers, uh, hangers on like me, uh, anybody interested could come, but the main thing was to feature the wasp. Well, the tornado hit, and everybody said, under the tables, under the tables. Now, they were long picnic tables with just folding chairs, and these women by that time were 85-ish and older, and uh, they had to get under the tables, as did everybody else. So they all got under the tables, and the tornado passed, and it ripped some of the tent, but they were all safe and all that. And they sent the fire department in to rescue everyone who was in there. And I don't know how many really were able to walk out on their own, probably a whole lot. 
but they carried out some of these older gals. And uh, some, a reporter who did not know who this was reported that, yeah, this, this one little lady's fire, good looking fireman was carried, a firefighter was carrying her out. And she was a redhead. And she, we asked her, said, gee, were you scared in there? And she said, hell no, I'm having the best time of my life. <laughs> that's, that's the Liz we all knew, correct? Anyway, that, as I wasn't there to witness it, but I wrote it up in the WASP News. Okay, I want to show a film that will tell you the difference, uh, the difference and the similarities then in the WAFs and the WASP. I write specifically about the women ferry pilots. There, they weren't all, it wasn't just the 28, they were the first. But the first six classes that graduated from Houston and then Sweetwater in Texas became part of, they were called WAFs until uh, uh, August of 43, and then they all became WASP. Everybody became a WASP. Didn't change anything except the name of the whole group. And Cochran was, was in charge of the whole group. Okay. The... The WAFs, excuse me, the ferry pilots, women ferry pilots, WASP ferry pilots numbered 303. The rest of those women were assigned to several other also important jobs. Betty Strophus, Liz Strophus, <clears throat> was one of many, many, many of them who learned to tow targets. That was a dangerous job. The guy, now the ones I know the most about were class 43-3 that trained down at Camp Davis in North Carolina, which was a swamp. And the gals were sent down there to fly uh, A-24s, which is a powerful single engine aircraft, uh, and tow a target behind it. Okay, there were 17 and 18 year old, I think some seven, anyway, 18 year old recruits down on the beach with great big guns and their job was to shoot at the target sleeve that those gals were towing. I've forgotten how far out, how many meters, I should know, but anyway, so <laughs> they took off. Now, they had an instructor in the back seat initially, but, and I could be wrong, at later they, they could, once they had learned com completely how to, how to fly it, and it was a powerful plane, then they flew by themselves. But anyway, they're towing this target. Well, the kid's aim wasn't always real good. Some of that lead hit the airplanes. Dangerous job. There, there was a rumor, there was an accident. Uh, there were two. Uh, two women were killed, two wasps were killed, fair, uh, towing aircraft, uh, excuse me, towing sleeves. Uh, everything I've heard from the experts is that they were not shot down by bullets. It was malfunction of the airplane. That is my understanding, and I'll stand by it because no one has told me different, but the rumor is still out that the girls were shot down. No, to my knowledge, they were not. It was aircraft malfunction, which was fairly rampant down there because these a, uh, uh, A24s were kind of being kept together by the mechanics. They, uh, they weren't, they weren't in very good shape. They were kind of used up airplanes. So this makes sense. So anyway, that's, that's what happened is 303 went to the ferry command. The rest of them were sent to, uh, to learn to tow targets. They, did, uh, exec they flew non-flying personnel around. They did, uh, what did they call it? Um, they weren't executive flights, but anyway, uh, they would transport uh, materials. Sometimes they, they just would take cargo. They did flight instructing. I think Liz was a flight instructor at one point. I know she served at Nellis uh, most of the time. When I get home, I'm gonna look up my sources and find out where she went first, because I do not know. If somebody knows, I wish they'd tell me, but I, I have a source at home that tells me where every WASP was originally stationed and where she went after that. And I just know, <clears throat> 
excuse me, she ended in Nellis. So anyway, that's how we got WAFs and WUFTEDs and then WASP. From 1943, August on, they were the WASP, and that is how they're known today, which is a whole lot easier than saying the other names. So when you hear about the WASP, there are 1,102 of them, total, ever, no more. And I write about the 303 who flew, who ferried, specifically the 134 who flew pursuit aircraft. That's what you're going to learn about in my film. Recruits for the Women's Auxiliary Ferry Squadron report for training at Wilmington, Delaware. Licensed civilian pilots, they will ferry warplanes from factories to airfields, signing up as WAFs. Going for their tryout with military planes. Not in the Army, they're a civilian group. Number limited to 50, and hardly more than 200 women in the country could qualify, so strict are the requirements. Their director is Mrs. Nancy Harkness Love, who now shows the WAFs how to handle a military training plane. Report this station at your own expense immediately for an interview and flight check. Stop. Advise, stop, love, and Baker, which was the CEO of the base. So this was my notification that I was accepted to come to Wilmington at my own expense to take a flight check and a physical to see whether I could become one of the group. He never expected a woman to ever use her train. So, and I went out to take my flight check and I passed that. I was hired to learn how to do it the Army way. We were a part of the Ferry Command, Women's Auxiliary Ferrying Squadron. But this was the start. This was the first group of 25 and were accepted into this experimental group. When I got my telegram, it was uh, signed, Love Baker. And I said, I don't know a Colonel Baker. And sending his love? What's this all about? Well, I found out it was Nancy Love. And when I was flying at Boston, I knew Nancy Love because her husband uh, owned uh, Intercity Airways. Well, Nancy was uh, single-minded on what her purpose was. Her feeling was that the ability of taking women who already knew how to fly and were capable of stepping in with very little training to ferrying airplanes was was her gain. And with the fact that there were probably only maybe a hundred women in the United States at that point in time that had the requirements, maybe two squadrons, possibly a third as the girls accumulated the time. But that was the maximum that probably was going to be set up. Not to cost the government anything that these trained women would come in and meld into the system, relieve the men for combat with absolutely no really turmoil, no train, no extra training, and so forth. So the amount of women that could do that was very limited. Now Jackie's idea was that it could be a big organization and we could take any girl off the street out of any form of life and her job and train them to be a pilot. Uh, there were, were 25, 26 of us young ladies we had to learn how to do it the Army way. If you've been in the Army, you know there's a right way, wrong way, and the Army way. Then we started ferrying. My first trip was a Cub from um, Lock Haven, Pennsylvania, to New Orleans. And there were a group of about six of us all going in the same general direction. It was cold. Ground was completely covered with snow. The only thing you could see would be a railroad or a road, but otherwise the complete landscape was covered with snow. And of course we had no radios, we had no navigation, we had a needle ball, airspeed, oil temperature, and oil <laughs> pressure gauge. And I think it's uh, IFR, I follow the railroad. I say today I don't know how we ever found Greensboro, North Carolina. It was solid snow. No way of telling which way to go, except that we had a map and we went from town to town with our finger on the map and holding a compass heading and uh, we managed to find where we were going every time. Yeah, that's the Fairchild PT-19. See, we used to go over and get those at uh, Hagerstown, Maryland. My first trip was from uh, Hagerstown down to Tennessee and Helen Mary Clark was my flight leader. 
And that was cold. I thought I was going to freeze to death. First leg, then we picked these up at Great Falls, Montana. Uh -huh. The first trip was to go to Billings. Billings. We had orders, six of us had orders to go from Wilmington to Delaware to go out there in Great Falls, Montana and pick up these six steamers in December, in December. 1942. Burr. Snow on the ground, uh -huh. Uh -huh. frozen ponds everywhere, you know. We had all those heavy flying shoes, you know, yeah. fleece line, yeah. and these boots and, and everything, and we had face masks. I uh -huh. was still cold. We went up to Great Falls to pick up the steermas to take them to Jackson, Tennessee. And uh, on this same trip, there were 17 male pilots that went along on this trip. And the reason I'm mentioning that is because the six wafts made in record time in the bad weather, uh, the six male pilots out of 17 made it to Jackson, Tennessee. This is where we proved how good we could fly. <laughs> it blessed the wafts that made it through. I was going to tell you about they had to heat, heat the oil. It was so cold up there, and, and uh, I told Florine she could take the first leg. The flight leader stays in the back and hurts the... You were the flight leader. Yeah, okay. the flight leader. And um, I noticed uh, after we were up for a while, I guess maybe 40 miles or so, Florine started to slow down. The, the whole flight started slowing down, and we were sort of, we weren't in a close formation. One airplane got behind Florine, the next one kept going, and it kept getting slower and slower, and I didn't know what was happening. I thought they were having some kind of engine problem. And Florine made a turn, and everybody started following her around. And we had no means of communication. So after everybody followed her around, she spotted, she remembered something about the field. I didn't know this. We had no checkpoints because the, all Montana, it was snow covered. Everything was just like almost a whiteout. And we went in to the emergency strip. And in fact, I didn't even see the emergency strip uh, because it was all wet. The eagle eye spotted this thing. <laughs> And, and as a, somebody had shoveled the snow, and there was just snow banks on either side. And I was so proud of those girls. One by one, they went in. And you know, they was, that airplane was known as a ground open airplane. And they must have stood right on those riders and went all the way straight in. But uh, we turned around and we got out of there. When we found out that Florian's map had blown out of the, the cockpit. And of course, Batson was sitting on her map. <laughs> <laughs> That was the last time that happened, too. When I took over and we got, we got out of there, I said, let's have hand signals. We couldn't stop the airplanes. So the next stop we to get gas. I said, we're going to have hand signals from now on. In case something happens, we acknowledge what we're trying to tell with the hand signals, the hand lighting. So uh, that's how we got cross country on and got out of Billings, Montana. But we were very fortunate on that. We plow into one of those banks. Well, I think the stimulus was the war, and the fact that the biggest need that we had uh, in mid-43 was the fact that we there was a need for fighter airplanes. It's easier just to send a single girl in an airplane on a trip than it was to send her as a co-pilot with a man, so the idea of sending air, women by themselves was kind of interesting, particularly to the guy's wives, so I think that uh, was one of the sidelights <laughs> to this. But the big push was for fighter airplanes, it was what we really needed. To. I flew my first P-47 at Wilmington, Delaware, I got checked out in it then. You're, you're concentrating on what you're doing, right. and you don't think to, what am, what's going through my mind other than, am I following procedure? Boy, here, here I am, flying something like this. I never dreamt I'd be flying. We were just happy to fly Piper Cubs, mm -hmm. PT-19s, flying all over the country and getting paid for it, mm -hmm. and getting per diem. What more do you want? First pursuit I flew, I was checked out by Doc Livingston in Palm Springs before pursuit school really started. We were flying with 2,000 horsepower and a great big four-bladed propeller out in front that when that thing turned, we were going to get um, such a twist to the airplane that we were going to have to have our right foot on the rudders in order to maintain directional control down the run. And once you checked out in it, then the next morning you were on orders and probably the first place you'd go with the P-51 would be Newark, New Jersey. And that's about eight hours away. And by this time, of course, we're having a whole lot of pursuit planes being manufactured. OK. 
Okay. On the East Coast was the P-47s, and on the West Coast you had the P-51s. The, uh, the P-38. P-38. And they needed pursuit pilots, you know, to right. ferry them to, mostly we took them to Newark, New Jersey. The flight transition is in Palm Springs because that was the beginning of pursuit school. Transition had a, had a very set policy of what you do. I mean, we were given a manual to read. Uh, we studied it. We took a uh, written test. We went out and sat in the cockpit for a long period of time till we knew where everything was. We learned all the uh, emergency systems, emergency gear system, the flap system, the fuel system, and so forth. So the idea of getting checked out in pursuit became very, very a prominent part of our life in early 44. That the rule came down that every girl that stayed in the ferry command had to be checked out in single engine pursuit because that was going to be the big push. Some of them didn't want to fly pursuit. Some of them uh, didn't pass pursuit school. Everybody didn't graduate. They had to have certain qualifications, and being civilians, they were either allowed to quit and go home, or they could ask for a transfer, and several of the girls transferred to other commands. We were pretty well qualified in everything up the step that, that was available in that particular area. The real need was to fly the P-38s and the P-51s and the P-47s because those were what were going to win the war. In 1944, I was based mainly at uh, Republic Aircraft on uh, flew the C-60 uh, and then we had to have uh, instrument rating. Mm -hmm. And I got my instrument rating at Wilmington. And the reason I got that on the C-60 is that many times when I'd go up to uh, Long Island, some days I'd be flying P-47, sometimes a C-60. What we used it for was uh, to bring the pilots back, back to Long Island so we could take another trip with the P-47. We took off towards the east. We could just make a great big circle around Long Island and make it 30 minutes. Wow. So uh, uh, sometimes we would deliver four and five airplanes a day, especially if uh, the weather had been bad and the airplanes were parked on the runways and they had to get them off in order to get them more airplanes on the apron strip. So uh, was Teresa James and I would alternate on the C-60s. She would try to land the C-60 shorter than I did, and I believe she went out. Then the right. summer of 44, I was sent to Evansville, Indiana. There was a modification place for P-47s. And, okay. Uh, and I think you've seen that picture. We stand in front of a P-47. Yeah. And, uh, and the control officer's right here, and I'm standing next to him. Yeah. And then we were lined up, and some of them on top of the wing. Yep, I've seen that one. And, yeah. Um, so I was sort of in charge of the group there. Okay. And Nancy Love had gotten us a house. She had rented us a house in town, in Evansville. Okay. And that's, we used that as our BOQ. We picked up P-51s from North American and DC-3s from Douglas and took them wherever they were going to be used. And they, we, we were just ferrying them from the point of where they were built to where they were going to be stationed. If there was a push for getting P-51s out of North American, then we all flew P-51s. We took most of the 51s and 38s to Newark, where they took the wings off and put them on a ship and shipped them to Europe. Made my approach, not being able to see ahead in, in this airplane, and certainly with the haze that day, it was about 10 feet lower than I intended to be. And I flew right straight into a telephone pole. It caused the nose of the airplane to shoot straight up and start to roll on its back. I hit the pole, the vibration started, and I thought it the panel was vibrating to the extent I could not read an instrument. Well, and as I was flying out, I had to hold hard left rudder and right stick. And so I was sitting crooked in the seat all the time, trying to keep the nose of that airplane straight ahead. I turned around to go back to the airport. And what did I see? But nothing but black sky, mm. black. Everything was black. No airport anywhere. Mm. That airport had to be there. Geographically, it had to be there. It was there, but it had no lights on. But 
I was lined up with the runway just fine, and I knew where I was. Got that thing in position, pulled that third of the power back, and boy, that thing stuck. It sat down, no bounce left in it. The plane has a four-bladed prop. About that much a foot of one prop was melted off and gone. I wonder it vibrated. It was vibrating oh. off it because the engine should have fallen should out. Fall. Well, sure enough, under the airplane, from the engine nacelle, clear back to the tail wheel, it was ripped open just like a can opener. And I finally got out of the cockpit there and onto the wing. A maintenance man who went right beside of me up on the wing and he jumps in the cockpit and sure enough, his foot goes right through the floor. Uh, they checked in the gas tanks and I didn't have anything but vapor in the gas oh. tanks. Not anything. Oh my. Dry. But sure enough, it, I had enough that I turned the switch off. It didn't quit me. They all flew single engine pursuit. And that's really what was needed. In one day, there'd be 50 airplanes sitting on the airport oh. that had to be delivered that day. So we all, when we came back from a trip at night, checked in, turned our papers in, then we were on the list for the following morning. Word came down that we were through December 20th. 30 or so P-51 sitting at Long Beach Airport the morning I went home and 40 of my girls all got in their car and drove home instead of ferrying those airplanes and it broke my heart. Daily or weekly basis that they were responsible for carrying. Yes, uh, and you heard BJ say sometimes there could be 50 air, 50 P-51s on at Long Beach waiting to be ferried. Uh, same thing at Wilmington, the P-47s, uh, and you heard Gertrude say on a really good day, and there weren't many of them uh, in in the, in the east in Wilmington, they could ferry four or five a day because it was a 30-minute flight across Long Island uh, into Newark, and then the C-60 uh, was flown, uh, went, followed them, and took everybody back. And I, I just learned recently, I never knew this, there were only eight of the women at a time stationed up in, uh, uh, in Wilmington, not at, excuse me, in Farmingdale, uh, flying the P-47s. I want to tell you a little bit about our um, local uh, oh, wasp, Liz. Liz. Um, Liz. Liz is from Faribault, Minnesota, and I think, uh, how many of you went to her funeral? I think there was a bunch of us. The, um, after finishing high school, I'll just read this very briefly. After finishing high school, Liz got a job in a courthouse in the small city of Faribault, Minnesota. In a family of six kids, there, there was no money for college in the 30s, but Liz uh, really wanted to see the world. A friend, Frank, would come, up, uh, would, would come up into the office and talk about flying. Uh, that got her interest. One, one day, he asked Liz if she would like to fly. Would I like to be up in a plane? You bet, she said. Uh, so, so Frank took her out to the airfield, and I think the airfield is now named Strophus uh, yes. Field there in yes. uh, Faribault. Uh, <clears throat> he introduced her to his friend uh, and uh, gave her a ride. Uh, after the first spin, uh, he, he looked at her and, and put his finger up and said, one more time. Uh, he, he did this uh, spin with Liz and kept on going. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Liz then went down to the bank and borrowed a hundred dollars. That was the cost of flying lessons. And uh, that was the cost of lessons at the CAP uh, in, in Minnesota. The banker knew her and her family. He said, women don't fly. Liz said, this one's going to. Uh, he gave her the loan and she started taking flying lessons and um, uh, became a part of, of the uh, topic. Uh, as, 
as was mentioned, she uh, after she finished flight school, she went to what they call Las Vegas Airfield, which of course is now Nellis Air Force Base, and uh, towed targets as uh, as Sarah had mentioned. If, if any of you went to the air shows, uh, I think she hugged every guy on the at, at the air show. She was just that type of a person, and uh, great memories. And, and, and sad we don't have her here now. Major Morris is the pilot 130. Uh, would you tell us what what attracted you to become a pilot? Um, oh gosh. Uh, I think some of the influences started like when I was young. My my dad was never he was never a pilot. We had family members that were extended family members that were pilots, but nobody that I was ever influenced by. But we would drive up to my grandparents' house in Wisconsin and we'd always go by O'Hare and for whatever reason he was always one of those kind of guys that would be like coming in for a landing, you know, like just really super excited about airplanes. Um, and I think that had a lot of influence on me deciding to be a pilot. And then kind of fast forward into high school, I had a recruiter, or um, excuse me, a Lieutenant Colonel Reserve American Airlines pilot come in for like a career day. So you're from Chicago area? Uh, yeah, Sorora, Illinois, originally. Um, and he, I don't even remember what he said, but I came home that day and basically told my mom I wanted to be a pilot. And I don't know, from that point, that's just kind of where I went. I think she was a little surprised. I think she was expecting me to kind of, you know, just be a whim kind of thing, but I stuck with it, and here I am today, so. Uh, how long have you been in the Air Force? Almost 15 years in May, so in it's, May. yeah. Uh, where did you do your basic uh, training? Um, I did, well, I did ROTC in, at the University of Illinois, so I kind of did that, and then did the field training, which is, I guess, your the basic training part of it. Um, your flight training, though. Um, I did all my degrees in college were aviation human factors, so I got all my ratings while I was at school. Uh, so I went through that whole program down at U of I when they actually had the program still at um, the school at the actual university. Um, so I did that, and then within the ROTC program, and then that's kind of the the colonel that was our detachment commander. Um, he knew that I was pretty serious about being a pilot, so he made sure it happened. Uh, where did you do your basic flight? Uh, my training. training, I did that down at Enid, Oklahoma, at Vance Air Force Base was where I did initial, right. and then I transitioned because uh, I tracked C-130s and went down to Corpus Christi and flew with the Navy for, I don't know, I think it was like five or six months, so before I went to Little Rock to do the follow-on training. Okay, so Little Rock is now the C-130 yes. uh, special training. Yep, that's the schoolhouse in Little Rock Air Force Base, so that's, and they still have it there. I mean, they've had a couple other locations, but that's been the primary for a lot of years now. Now, you live in uh, in Minnesota now? Correct. And do you, is your full-time job in the Air Force Reserve? Yeah, I'm a full-timer, um, but the funny thing is that I'm actually going to be moving back to Little Rock here in a couple weeks, so I'm, I picked up a different type of job down there that's still C-130 related, but it'll take me to do something a little different than I've been doing. You know, the thing I think that all of us in Minnesota have a great source of pride in the 133rd and the 934th. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about how many deployments and how many hours you have uh, on, on your record now? Um, oh gosh, uh, I think it's, I don't even know if it's five or six deployments I have under my belt. Um, some four months, I think a couple like two monthers in there. Um, and then, uh, oh, sorry, what was the other? I completely well, lost. Well, just ab ab about how many, how many oh. hours? Uh, oh, hours, that's right. Um, pretty close to about 3,500 or so. I'm not even sure exactly the number, but it's, it's up there. What uh, what are some of the ex exciting uh, flights, landings? Uh, because I know I know that you guys have spent a lot of time in the Middle East and Afghanistan. Um, we're on kind of a two-year cycle, so it's it's not too bad. Um, every I mean, in between that, we do all kinds of stuff. I mean, we've done a couple different uh, exercise type month th things with Poland. Um, actually flying with the Poland, Polish uh, Air Force, who actually have C-130s. Did so you fly into uh, Camp Trump? Uh, no, we didn't. Where did you fly into Poland? Um, oh my gosh, what was the base called? I can't even remember right now. Um, War in the Warsaw area or? No, it was, oh crap. I, no, it's fine. Yep, yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. Can't think off the top of my head right now. No, but. no. It's Not too far from like Poznan area, so okay. I can't remember what the exact base is at the top of my head, but 
Well, I, uh, the, the reason I ask, I know some, uh, have some friends that have a, uh, an army intelligence that's at uh, a um, secure post in Poland. So oh, okay. there's, uh, th there's a lot of interest in our uh, mm -hmm. deployments to Poland. Uh, have you flown into Afghanistan? I have, yeah. I've never been actually deployed in Afghanistan, but I've flown in a few <coughs> times, usually to do um, like DV, uh, distinguished visitor type stuff. Um, I think that's been the majority of it. So, uh, so you've got 15 years. You're you're being transferred down to Little Rock now. Uh, are you going to be an IP there, in, instructor pilot? Yeah, or? I am currently. I have been for quite a few years now. But yeah, I'll, I'll have to. Part of the qualifications with what I'm going to be doing, I'm required to be still be an instructor. Um, it's like a sim certifying certification type thing. So I'll actually be certifying our simulators to make sure that they're actually performing in the manner that we need them to for our training. Yeah. Um, what are your uh, goals beyond uh, Little Rock? Ah, uh, gosh, I don't even know. I, I tend to just kind of go with the whims, like things will pop up and it just sounds like a good idea and that's kind of what I go for. <laughs> I don't know why it, it works out that way, but you know, that's kind of how I ended up up here too. It just I got an email about an open position and I hemmed and hawed and then one of the guys that's actually here with me, he was like, well, you should come up. And I'm like, okay, sounds good. And so that's kind of how that one worked out. Like, so that's kind of how it's always been. It's just kind of, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Let's do that. Say something about the 134th though. I, th I think you have a great uh, deal of pride to be a, a 134th uh, member here. Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, it's a great unit. I've, I've really enjoyed my four years that I've been here flying with the 96 airlift squadron and um, I mean it's yeah, a good group of people so I, I can't ask for a better group of people to fly with. Yeah. Uh, is Julie Jensen still back there? I saw her at one time. Ju Julie was responsible for recruiting for this on short notice. I, 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 I didn't get a chance to uh, talk to her. I got the email when I got home last night at one o'clock. Yep. So uh, anyway, we, we really appreciate you coming on and we'll, we'll fire some more questions at you. Okay. Uh, Danielle, now you, you're from southwestern Minnesota. Yes. You and I met at the air show at Eden Prairie. And by the way, if you look at the, uh, at the newsletter, there's an air show there in the middle of July this year. What, what attracted you to, to choose WASP to be a reenactor? Re when I first started doing this, the girls that I reenact with, they all represent one branch of the name of the service, whether it's WAVES, SWAFs, SWACs, etc. And my husband loves the military and the aviation side of it just as much as I did. And he's like, you know, there's not a lot of people that reenact as well as And we did some research and found the main reason why is there wasn't a lot of them. Well, now t t tell us about the uh, this reenactment group. I. I, I when I talked to you one time, I know you're the only WASP reenactor, yeah. but the, the, the larger group, tell us about that. And The larger group is based out of Hastings. The girls, the women's side of it um, is run by Lissa Kish, and we're called the Cat's Meow World War II girls. Her husband does, Paul Kish does the men's side of it with the ground battles and stuff that you may see in, they do Little Log House Pioneer sh Show Days every year in July and the men will do the ground battle, and then we're based out of one of the buildings, and we have our memorabilia and stuff out there, and we answer questions. And we do fashion shows sometimes if we can get it arranged. Sometimes it's too warm, <laughs> but well, we try. And, and uh, I, I know that uh, you're a paralegal for a firm down in... Southern Minnesota. Southern Minnesota, yeah. yeah. Uh, how many people are in the Hastings group? It depends because we have some that they have full-time jobs just like I do. If they can come up, they will. I want to say there's probably about six to eight core girls, and then there's more that will come and, come and go as they can afford what, do, what, do you have monthly meetings then? or We don't. We just kind of, when the do a gaggle. air show and everything starts coming around that season, we get together and we start going to air shows. Or Like it may all be in... Dundas, we do World War II days. Yeah, well, great. So. Um, it's, um, now, you said your husband is, is military? No, he's, so he has a love of military. Did, did your family, was my there any military in your my family? My great-grandfather was in World War I. My dad was a Vietnam veteran. And I have 
aunts and uncles that have served as well as my, some of my cousins that are still serving okay. in various branches. So. Well, it's, uh, Sarah, you've got to be proud that someone uh, of this caliber would uh, choose to represent your group. I'm going to go up this aisle if there's any questions. Uh, in fact, I'm going to ask one. I'm going to preempt here. Uh, Sarah told me a story. Uh, as you know, the group before they did the BT-13 for the WASP at Avenger Field, mm -hmm. they built a, a glider, the CG-4 glider that's out at the Fagan Museum in Granite Falls. Mm -hmm. uh, you told me a story that some of the um, WASP were selected to do uh, CG4 towing at Lubbock. Can you tell that story? I'll try and tell it quickly. Uh, the reason I even know about it is that uh, one of my original WAFs by the name of Dorothy Scott uh, was stationed at Dallas and was grounded for a sinus infection. And she was the kind who liked to stay active, so they sent her to Lubbock to kind of find out how this transition was going with the wasp who had been sent over there learning to tow gliders. Excuse me, yeah, tow gliders. And uh, as I say, Dorothy was just kind of an overseer. It's the first time I knew anything about that. Then I came to find out that there was a whole, there was a, a base there and that, that of course there were, there were men towing gliders, but they wanted to see if the wasp could do it. These were women from the fifth and sixth classes. I told you most of them went to the ferry command, not all of them. And there was a corps that were, were sent over there to learn to tow the gliders. Uh, Dorothy's report, interestingly enough, was she thought the A, uh, A20, uh, A24 was a good plane for the women to be flying, but she did not like the, uh, the big twin engine one. She didn't think, and I think it was a C60, but I'm not sure. So I'm not, don't quote me on that one. Well, uh, that was her report. Uh, just, if you, a lot of people haven't been to Lubbock, Texas, right? I'm going next but week. But you're going next week. Yes. <laughs> but uh, the, what used to be the municipal uh, um, terminal at, at the field is now the Silent Wings Museum. Yes, I'm going to get but, to see but it. The Lub <laughs> but the Lubbock Airport was the South Plains Army yes. Airfield That's right. where they trained glider pilots. Glider pilots yes. West of Lubbock was a, a, um, uh, another field. It was at one time Reese Air Force Base, and it was a uh, pilot training base. I, I don't know when that closed. Uh, do you know, Michelle? Uh, I, know. I had a friend that actually got his uh, uh, primary training at Reese, but uh, what they did at Reese, and I'm not sure what's there now, but it was the, uh, the tow planes were based at Reese, west of Lubbock, and okay. the gliders were based at, uh, at ah. the, the Army, okay. at the munis municipal airport right. at this point, yeah. Did not know that. And so uh, you, can, you can research, and I sent you some of my yeah. contacts down yeah. there. Did Liz Strophus fly multi-engine planes and did she ferry them to England? No, no, none of the WASP ferried them to England. They will tell you that themselves. Uh, and there are people who say they've seen them, but every one of them I've ever talked to, and that's the word, they did not fly ferry to England. There were two pilots, Nancy Love and Betty Gillies, number one and two in the ferry command, who were to fly AB-17 there in uh, September 1943. Hap Arnold called them back. Don't, I don't want women flying into the combat zone without study and approval. And none of them ever did after that. So they, they got as far as Goose Bay, Labrador. And that's not over the Atlantic. Okay. Yeah. So they did fly them to Labrador or Greenland? Nobody fly, they didn't make it to Greenland. They okay. were stopped before they got, they did fly to Canada, but it was mainly like Montreal and out west. They ferried trainers up there to Canada. So yes, they did fly to Canada. Did, did she ever fly like a B-17 or a B-24? No, I would seriously doubt it. I told Don today, uh, basically women could not handle the B-24. It was a beast. Yeah. And I th some of them were checked out, but I'm pretty sure they always had a male co-pilot or they were flying. Co 
A lot of them who were stationed in Romulus, Michigan, were co-pilots on the B-24s that were, uh, were, were built at Willow Run. But they did not, they did not, Ferry, they did not ferry the B-20, no, they did not ferry the B-24. Uh, they, I think they might have ferried a couple of B-25s, and yes, women flew the B-17. But I would doubt okay. that Liz flew any of those multi-engines, but I could be wrong. Well, I had coffee with her one time. Did she, and she I told got, you she did, she I, did. I, I got the impression <clears throat> that she did. Then if she told you, she did. <laughs> yeah. Uh, to, uh, yeah. Yeah, let it go with that. Uh, there's a, uh, a, a story that uh, maybe the Larry Bachman story, some of you knew, knew Larry uh, from Bachman's Nursery. Uh, we heard a story today where he was in England and a B-17 came yes. in. Yes. Tell, tell that story, Liz. He or, swears or he saw two, uh, two wasps get out of a B-17 in England. No. I, I, you know. All I know is what I have been told by the experts who were there. And no, none of them flew to England. Did, Maybe did, somebody after the war? Did, did the ferry, uh, did the WASP ferry up to uh, Fairbanks, Alaska? No, that's okay. May I tell that one? Uh, the P-39s and later the P-63s out of Buffalo or Niagara, I never remember which one, uh, but uh, the women stationed at Romulus, Michigan, went over to Niagara uh, uh, to pick up P-39s, a single engine a fighter plane, uh, to ferry, it, ferry them to Great Falls, Montana. Women were not allowed to ferry on to Alaska because they didn't have, they didn't have a place to keep them. And they were so scared of crossing lines back then that, okay, so they didn't have quarters and all for them. No, they were not, the women are not allowed to ferry to Fairbanks. The men picked them up uh, in Great, Great Falls. Falls and took them on up. Fairbanks. Then later the P-63, which was the improved and, and slightly larger King Cobra, uh, yeah. same thing. And the, the reason that Great, uh, Great uh, I'm sorry, that uh, Fairbanks is such an important yes. story yes. is that's where the Russians yes. picked up the planes that we were... Uh, doing under the lend lease to yes. the Russians and then flew them. Uh, my my son flew in the F-15 demonstration uh, air show group uh, years back, and we were up at uh, Anchorage. Uh, what, what's the base there? Uh, Elmendorf. Elmendorf. And uh, we, we went out to the airport, and they had just discovered a, uh, a P-39, the Air Cobra. P uh, out in the boonies there that so, some Russian pilot had crashed and this, oh. this was this was in like 2008 or something you like know that, what they so. said about the Russian pilots who got in them no there was full stop and full full to, to, to the firewall that's all they flew okay yeah, this is for Sarah um, the the planes that were being ferried was this their first flight had they been checked out or are you talking about the pursuits <laughs> yes <laughs> Yeah, <clears throat> some of them had had maybe five minutes. The girls never knew quite. Then I later heard that as we got more into it and there were more to fly, that one out of five was checked. So, I mean, there are different stories like that, but they didn't have a whole lot of time on them when the gals stepped into them. It was, uh, it was ba ba not quite the maiden flight, but almost. Yes, I have a question for all of you women who know about the history of women in aviation and um, how, what the effect, it seems that the effect of these women, obviously they proved during the war that women were comp extremely capable. And yet now we have to, it seems that after the war they just disappeared for how Shut many years until we have years. our women now yeah. in air service who are doing an amazing job and thank you for your yes. service by the way. Yes, basically yes. Uh, go back home, you know have babies, all that other stuff, and most of them did. Uh, a few a few flew soon after the war, people who maybe, girls who had had uh, connection with air flight schools or something. But the, really there was, there was almost nothing to do. Aviation kind of died uh, because of the war 
and the women certainly were kept out of it. And as we climbed out, it was all male. It was 1974, I believe, when the Navy hired the first six or eight women pilots. Uh, and Hap Arnold, on December 20th, 44, when he closed down the WASP, said no women will, will get into the cockpit of a military aircraft, period. Well, I, I, I'd 70, like to amplify that, and you can correct that. my story on this. Liz was someplace when, when, when that order went out, and uh, it, it was a freeze, and you, you correct my story, oh, yeah. but you're there, you got no money to get home, yeah. you're just stuck. Do you remember that story? Well, I, I, I did several interviews with, with Liz, and like I say, she was in Timbuktu, and all of a sudden, the order came out. She probably was Get home stuck. as best you can, a hitchhike or whatever. So The women ferry pilots were, they were trying to keep them from getting out and getting caught by weather because, no, they could not, They had to get back on their own power. That's true. Could you talk a little bit about what it's like to be now as a female flying, and what do the numbers look like? Are there more and more women coming in? Is it, is it do you feel like it's on an equal playing field now, or are there some things that women still are assumed not not in your purview? I mean, in my experience, like, I, I feel like it's pretty mm. equal. I haven't really run into any issues, Good. but I mean, you'll hear Good. stories occasionally that'll come out, different um, airframes. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's, I mean, there, you'll see more and more. I mean, we're definitely seeing more and more females come through. I think when I first got in the squadron about four years ago, there was only two of us. Um, and I mean, there was other females, NAVs and uh, loadmasters, and now we have pretty much a females in every crew position and mm -hmm. multiples so you know I think overall that it, it's improving it still could probably improve more I mean it's mm -hmm. no you know it'd be good to see more women out there being in the military and aviation mm -hmm. but it's still pretty small I think in comparison Don I've known uh, Liz Strophus about 20 years ago and uh, she told us a story one time uh, when she got out of the service she applied for a job at Northwest Airlines and they told her at the time they'd only give her an office position, I think a front office position they were called. Yep. And she told the employment personnel that uh, they can stick that job up, up you know, where, <laughs> where the sun doesn't shine. Good for her. And then uh, quite a few years later when Northwest picked up the 747, she was there and uh, she went over to the... Uh, I want to say the uh, flight simulator for the 47. Yeah. He just told that story to me. I can ver verify that story. I can verify. <laughs> Anyhow, she went over to the flight simulator and uh, she got to sit in the airplane and the, this one instructor said, well, you want to fly it? And she said, well, sure, I'll fly it. And uh, he says, you think it can land it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's, he says, all I need to know is the airspeed yeah. for, for landing. And she, she made it, no, no problem. Of course can't land, shouldn't be up there. <laughs> I heard that that instructor was quite astounded. Uh -huh, I'll bet. That not many had done. Yep. I had a friend who was a pilot in World War II. He was on the Ploeste low-level mission, and uh, the, he did a lot of flying. After that, he was stationed in Italy and uh, then later in England, and uh, did you know, in the neighborhood of 50 flights in Europe, he was flying uh, on D-Day and later went to the Eastern uh, Theater and did some flying there. It was not so much combat, but uh, he said he'd uh, assemble planes. Or, or he was involved in that, and when he got them assembled, he could uh, go on the mission or not, and uh, but anyway, wherever he was stationed in England, they were he and some of the crew were waiting for a new B-24 to come in, and uh, it came in, landed, and uh, two women, two small women, got off the plane, and uh, Can't be. He, uh, he felt very small <laughs> because it, hey, he thought it took. Ten men to fly a B-24. I don't think so. <laughs> I would tell you I know so, but never say. Well, listen. Um, 
Thank you, ladies, for doing this. Uh, I, th I think you have proven yourself, and thank you, Michelle, for doing thank it. We you wish, for wish your you service. great success. Yes, and Danielle, <laughs> I, I want you to keep your advocacy uh, yeah, uh, for, for that. Uh, You're good, and you look she, <laughs> authentic from <laughs> thank you. The, from you followed the pictures beautifully. And Sarah, thank you for coming. Support for this program provided by viewers like you. Thank you. Additional support provided through the Catherine B. Anderson Fund of the St. Paul Foundation. Upcoming roundtable topics can be found at www.mn-ww2roundtable.org. Production services provided by Barrows Productions.